So I'm going to turn it over to Ed Locke, Locke here from Boston University, and Ed will introduce himself. And may I interrupt you for a moment? As you go in through your yes. statement, it would be very helpful, as it's been just in the first five minutes, pointing out the inaccuracies for us, because this is our second committee hearing on this. I would not discount a third. So as you kind of move through this, it's okay to, for us for you to point out, as you have quite pointedly, you know, errors in discussion points prior to. Uh, my name is Edward Leckler, and I'm a professor of biology at uh, Boston University. Um, I am the person who provided these PowerPoint slides, and I'm yeah. going to be referring to them um, as I move through my testimony. Thank you. I teach genetics and molecular biology. For over 25 years, my laboratory has studied how chemicals cause mutations in cancer. And during that time, I've been continuously funded by the National Institutes of Health and or the American Cancer Society. I've been on the editorial boards of scientific journals, chemical research in toxicology, mutation research, and carcinogenesis. Methyl iodide is a dangerous compound. It notably causes neurotoxicity and cancer. And I'm amazed that for such a simple compound, methyl iodide is toxic by a surprisingly diverse set of mechanisms, some of which I'll mention, and some of my colleagues will mention others. In slide number one, one way that methyl iodide is toxic involves its ability to put a methyl group on almost anything indiscriminately. And a methyl group is just a carbon with three hydrogens. It's quite simple, but it causes havoc. There's a whole class of compounds that do this. They include methyl nitrosourea, methyl methane sulfonate. And inside cells, these compounds put methyl groups on proteins, RNA, DNA, everything. But putting methyl groups onto DNA is particularly unfortunate. And now I'm up to slide number two. Because it causes mutations in cancer. And the mechanism is not a mystery. It's well understood. The crucial site is this oxygen on the base guanine. And I've got a little circle around that methyl group. This modification leads to mutations in cancer because the methyl group causes mistakes when DNA is copied as cells are dividing. Now, the other two compounds I mentioned, methyl nitrosurea Methyl methane sulfonate are the best studied compounds in this class. They're the easiest to work with, and they're both ranked as probable human carcinogens by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And though less research has been done on methyl iodide, the work that has been done shows that methyl iodide behaves as expected. It methylates indiscriminately, and it puts a methyl group on that same oxygen. So in slide number three, is a list of relevant studies. And they show that methyl iodide reacts with DNA, causes cells to induce responses that indicate that the cell's DNA are sensing DNA damage. Methyl iodide causes mutations. It causes eukaryotic cells in culture to have properties like cancer cells. And it causes cancer in experimental animals. 22 of 25 published studies say that methyl iodide was positive in this regard. The company proposing to market methyl iodide shows that methyl iodide causes thyroid tumors. And this information was the basis for estimating methyl iodide's likely human cancer risk. Now, is there any direct evidence that methyl iodide causes cancer in humans? Well, the answer is no. But of all of this evidence, my best guess is yes. I think undoubtedly methyl iodide will cause cancer in humans. But how potent is it? Is there some value below which we don't have to worry very much? So I'm going to leave the cancer question behind for a minute, and I'm going to address instead what DPR has proposed. And they have a target value, which is 96 parts per billion for workers. I think this value is much too high. And I want to say that I believe those in DPR suggesting this value is good enough. They're acting honorably. And I think it's, this is merely an honest disagreement. But I want to tell you why I disagree with 96 parts per billion. Now, before I go through this, we've 
talked about these different groups within DPR, and I just want to make it clear on what the arrangement is. So in slide number four, over to the left here, there's DPR's risk assessment group. That's the medical toxicology branch. And they're the group that we interacted with, indicated by the uh, vertical arrow. Mm -hmm. And they produce a report. They pass it on to dis, uh, DPR's risk management group who made the decision. So that's the structure. And I'm going to contrast DPR's risk assessment evaluation, this is slide number five, there on the left here, with DPR's risk management decision, and that's on the right here. And the risk assessment document, this is part of it, it's 500 pages long. The document on the right is eight pages long, the risk management decision is eight pages long. Now, these risk assessments are based on, or the primary one that's discussed, is fetal death caused by methyl iodide treatment of pregnant rabbits. And so no rabbit fetuses died when pregnant rabbits were exposed to two parts per million methyl iodide. But fetuses did die at higher levels of methyl iodide. And later on, I'm going to tell you it's more complicated than that, but let's keep it simple for now, OK? So two parts per million is called the no observed effect level, or Noel, like the Christmas song. So I want to move on to the sixth sl slide, which mentions this two part per million at the top. And again, I want to contrast risk assessment on the left with risk management on the right. Risk management started with two parts per million and ended up with a human worker exposure of 96 parts per billion. That's on the right. Risk assessment within DPR started off with the same two parts per million and ended up with 0 0.8 parts per billion. So it's 120 times smaller. Now, I understand risk assessments evaluation, and so I want to go through it as quickly as I can here. So the first transformation is in slide number seven, and it has to do with differences between rabbits and humans. They breathe at different rates, different exposure times, and there's a safety factor that is built in. And that gets us down to 230 parts per billion. That gets us from two parts per million to 230 parts per billion. Now, in slide number eight, I want to start off by telling a short story. So certain molds grow on improperly stored peanuts and other foodstuffs. These molds make a compound called aflatoxin, which causes liver cancer. And this is a problem, as I say in my testimony, in so many parts of the world. So toxicologists wanted to study how does aflatoxin cause liver cancer. So they gave mice aflatoxin, and they got no cancer. Mm -hmm. So then they gave aflatoxin to rats, and rats get lots of cancer. And the difference in susceptibility of rats and mice is huge. It's greater than 100-fold. And this is called an interspecies difference in susceptibility, and it's often observed. So by analogy, humans might be more susceptible than rabbits to methyl iodide fetal death. So DPR's risk assessment group added what's called an interspecies uncertainty factor of threefold, just in case, to be prudent. And this is universally done. And this standard is described in the US EPA's integrated risk information system. So there's no mystery here about doing this, always done. 